Okay, we're going to explore a very surprising possibility on the horizon called the holographic universe. To do this, we need some background. And we're going to explore a region that I'm going to call the metacosm. That term may be foreign to you, but it'll be clear as we uh, partition ourselves. So before we do any of that, though, perhaps the most useful thing of the day will be a little tutorial about epistemology. That's a fancy word, which simply means the study of the origin, scope, and limits of knowledge. Now, uh, if you take that in college, it's probably a waste of time because it'll be given by the philosophy department, and you really end up just studying the different meaning of words through the years. We take pride, at least linguistically, in applying the scientific method. What do we mean by that? It actually means the empirical method. What is the scientific method actually, really? Well, first of all, the idea is you observe a phenomenon, you seek patterns and measures in the observations of that uh, phenomenon, then you formulate a hypothesis from the description of that, and here's where most people miss, you gather independent data to challenge the hypothesis. That's what we really mean. There's some subtleties here that are critical. Let me point those out. It's a search for failures. Do you realize a theory can never be proven? It can never be proven. What we mean by that, really, is they can defy being disproven. Those are not the same thing. The, the, the attack on a theory is to try to disprove it. If you can't disprove it, it starts to have some validity. But it's never truly proven in an absolute sense. And, uh, and Shannon's uh, a theory of verifiability simply means that untestable statements are meaningless. If you can't test it, it has no meaning as in, the, in the Shannon concept. And uh, so the, uh, the great tragedy of science, Huckley tells us, is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. <laughs> and so non-falsifiable hypotheses are non-scientific, and they're actually intellectually dishonest. In logic, the fallacy of argumentum ignorantium, which simply means an argument from ignorance, uh, is not valid. An assertion that something must be true simply because it hasn't been proven false is a, f a, a classic error in logic. We all make that, but we need to guard against that. Because scientific method is actually more rare than, than we would hope, there are inadequate masquerades in lieu of scientific method that we lean on. One of those is what's called the deductive method. That's simply deriving theories from generalizations about the universe. We make a generalization about it and, de and, de and derive a theory from that and call that deduction. It's not quite, it's not, it doesn't necessarily lead to truth. Another alternative to the scientific method are mathematical proofs. And many people stumble on this one. Mathematical proofs are simply elegant consistencies within a synthetic, that is, a man-made universe. In the field of mathematics, you have definitions, and from those definitions, you can build very elegant models. And the models, however elegant, are not necessarily valid experimentally. Don't confuse a mathematical proof from truth. They're not the same thing. And uh, so, there are domains of validity. There are a set of equations that have a finite but limited domain of validity. Gravity is a primary factor in the solar system, the sun and the planets. It turns out to be irrelevant in the galaxies, and I'll show you why shortly. That's, that, that's missed by most astronomers, so don't be surprised when we get into that. Domains of validity, equations that have do, do, a, a, a domain where they're valid, but there's also domains where they're not valid. And, uh, but the probably the most offense of all of these masquerades for truth is the concept of a peer review. You find a scientist has a theory and it, ga it gains a reputation by being reviewed by his peers. We put some uh, appellation on uh, someone who's had his thing appeared in a peer review journal. In other words, he got the sanction of his uh, compadres or whatever. That's an insidious factor in science today. Why? because it ossifies, it ren renders rigid current assumptions by the censorship of competing hypotheses. It's saying that your peers who have, are competing with you for notoriety are the final judge of the truth of your hypothesis. That's nonsense. 
and yet it's a very prevalent um, aspect of, of big science, uh, serious science. And so these are masquerades for the science. Don't confuse them with the scientific method, which is a sound basis of validation. And so there are some caveats here, of course. Inference is not proof. You may infer something, but that's not the same as proving it. And uh, you want to avoid the legal fallacy. There's a whole list of them. I'm only going to pick one to show you what I mean. And that's asserting the consequent. What do I mean by that? If A, then B. If B is true, therefore A is true. Okay, that's a, a, a typical linkage, if you will. For example, if it's raining, the street is wet. The street is wet, therefore it must be raining. Not necessarily, you see. It ignores the, an alternative possibility, such as a street machine, a, a street cleaning machine just went by. The point is that that is a logical uh, error that we all make. It's easy to stumble into if you're not guarding against it. So the illusion of knowledge, you know, there's things that keep you from the truth. But what's the most powerful barrier to truth? And that's the, the, the only certain barrier to truth is the conviction you already have it. That is the, one of the most effective barriers to truth. And uh, Borson said the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. And so that's part of, you know, we've used uh, Acts 1711 as our trademark for uh, many decades, that to be like the Bereans, in that they received the word with all readiness of nine and, oh, and, and searched the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And for, for many decades, I always emphasized that the idea is to check the Bible, search the scriptures. It turns out if you study that verse, that's not the most challenging part. It's the first part. To have a readiness of mind, to approach it with an open mind, setting aside our presuppositions which hinder us from seeing the truth. And so, but moving on then, the Lord woke me up about a year ago, middle of the night, with a phrase. And it's haunted me since, because I wasn't sure what the phrase meant. Metaphors reign where the mysteries reside. And that haunted me, what does that mean? Metaphors reign where mysteries reside. And now after reflecting on that for a good part of a year, I'm beginning to believe I think I understand what he's highlighting. When we don't understand something, we give it a fancy label and hide behind that as if we understood it. Metaphors reign where mysteries reside. That a fancy label may be hiding a truth we have yet to perceive. And we want to keep that in front of us. We use the term science and technology in our vocabulary all the time, especially in industry. Science and technology. What's the difference? They're profoundly different, by the way. Technology produces useful products. Technology validates itself in the marketplace. It results in something useful. So it doesn't have to argue for its existence. It emerges out of our economics. Science, on the other hand, has grown to be a religion, and it has its own priesthood. It has its own catechism. If you are a scientist who believes in creation, you will have a career-limiting problem. There are certain beliefs you can hold and even defend that are just not orthodox. No, it's a religion and it has its own priesthood. We need to be guarding against it. It's not what it used to be. The early years of science were peopled by people who were questing truth. Their dream was to discover what's true. Not today. Today it's a quest for mechanistic material explanations and deny any metaphysical tones whatsoever. Let's explore a little bit about the, you know, the history of science is pretty dotted with errors, by the way. The myths of the past, the flat earth, that was held by many, despite Isaiah 40, 22 and other passages in the Bible. The idea of burning led to Philistinon in 1667, which obviously was displaced by understanding chemical oxidation, what really happens when things burn. And uh, Ptolemaic cosmology. Now, Ptolemy was an interesting guy because he was wrong about a handful of things. But he, of course, advocated what we call a geocentric cosmology, that the sun revolves around the earth. And uh, that was obviously displaced by Copernicus and what is a heliocentric 
cosmology. The sun being the center of the solar system, the planets moving around it. Big controversy, not only on the streets, but in the churches back then. And Ptolemy, actually, uh, he, of Alexandria, he, went, he goes down in history as opposing two great truths of science. The sun-centered solar system, also the fourth dimension. I was surprised to discover this. He proved, at least in his own mind, that the fourth dimension is impossible because he couldn't visualize a fourth orthogonal line to the others. He just couldn't visualize that so it couldn't be true. And that, of course, is the great breakthrough of 20th century science. And uh, see, a higher dimensional geometry may turn out to be the ultimate source of unity uh, in our conceptions of the universe. Not only Einstein, but even subsequent. We'll talk a little bit about that shortly. So. The, uh, besides all of those, we have uh, ether as a medium of light. And that was disproved by the famous Michelson-Morley experiment in 1887. That's dear to me because we know where that was done. At the Naval Academy, at the Nebula. So we, we have that still marked where they did that there in the Stribling Walk. <coughs> the velocity of light was regarded as, its velocity was considered infinite in the days of Descartes. And uh, it, uh, it uh, till Romer and Bradley came along and punctured that, that light has a finite spe a speed. That was a shock to the scientific community. And Sutterfield Norman, that it's not only did it, is it finite, it's not a constant, it's getting smaller. The velocity of light, a big deal. Back in the 17th century, Kepler, Descartes, and others believed that light was instantaneous. In other words, the speed of light was infinite. And uh, in 1677, a guy by the name of Olaf Romer measured the elapsed time between eclipses of Jupiter with its moons which is a complex way of measuring the speed of light over great distances. And he discovered that it did indeed have a finite speed, not an infinite speed. And uh, interesting enough, it was ignored for 50 years until an Englishman, uh, James Bradley, confirmed Romer's work. And, but it's interesting to us to, for us to understand, even with proof, it took 50 years for it to be accepted by the scientific community. We need to understand that. Barry Sutterfield and Trevor Norman, back in, in uh, 1987, discovered the velocity. Well, and obviously finite, but it's been slowing down over the years. And so that's a myth still of the present. We have, of course, myths of the present, as I list those, you have to put evolution first. And that, uh, that the whole, when we say the word evolution, we don't really mean evolution. Obviously, there's evolve, evolving it going on. The real issue, what we mean by that is biogenesis. It's a more proper term. But clearly, Michael Denton, back in 1986, Philip Johnson, uh, Michael Behe and others have shredded that as a possibility among thinking scientists. You don't have to be a, a Christian or a biblical own person to recognize the nonsense that the, we now know that no way does the th so-called theory of evolution explain our origins. It's, it's non-supportable by thinking people, but that still is embedded in our culture. The, D uh, the discovery of the DNA puts that whole thing, uh, should put it out of... Uh, nail in its coffin, if you will. But the velocity of light's a basic constant in our thinking. Sever, uh, Satterfield and Norman uh, discovered it was slowing down, and we, we'll, we'll leave that for the moment. Uh, <coughs> the nebular hypothesis. If you take a course in astronomy in college, they'll, you'll still run into this peculiar hypothesis called the nebular hypothesis. What is it? Well, as, as uh, Kant would express it, some four billion years ago, the sun had ejected a tail or a filament of material that cooled and collected and thus formed the planets. It actually didn't originate with Kant. 21 years earlier, Emanuel Swedenborg uh, suggested that in his Latin publications. And uh, it was picked up by Laplace. He lent his endorsement to Kant's theory, but without checking the mathematical validations that he was capable of providing. Because he didn't challenge it, which he should have, it gained widespread acceptability and respectability despite serious mathematical flaws. And subsequent writers have continued to develop variations of this view, even though increasing difficulties render it increasingly doubtful. What do I mean by that? It turns out the sun contains over 99% of all the mass of the solar system. And yet, the sun contains only 1.9% of the angular momentum. And that's a huge problem if you're trying to build a mathematical model of the whole thing. The nine planets contain 98% of the angular momentum. How can that be? And this was all known by Laplace over a century ago. 
there is no plausible explanation that would support a solar origin of the planets. And uh, the, uh, there are other enigmas of the planets, by the way. There are three pairs of them with the spin rates that are within 3% of each other. Why? That's strange. Earth and Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, and Neptune and Uranus each have spin rates that are almost identical. Why? Why does that occur? They're not adjacent. Earth and Mars have virtually identical spin axes, about 23 and a half degrees. Why? The angular momentum and orbital calculations it seemed to suggest that three, the three pairs of planets had been brought here from somewhere else, captured in the orbits by some other uh, dynamic. Those are all, there's, and this gives rise to all kinds of speculative, speculative uh, explorations by people who are in interested in what we call, there's a, uh, that's a field of study called catastrophism, a recognition by scientists that, that things were not always as they are now, that there were disruptions. They see craters on the moon or on planets implies that the solar system was once a very rough neighborhood. And the idea that there were catastrophes of some kind that disrupted it. But those are all areas of speculation and conjecture. And they're recognized as conjectures. They're not sold as real science. Well, they're also myths of the present. We see a sense like, there is a black hole in the center of that galaxy. How do you know? Well, otherwise we cannot explain its level of energy output. Really? There's an invisible dark matter in that galaxy. Otherwise, we cannot explain how it rotates the way it does. See, these are conclusions we infer from suppositions. 96% of the universe is made up of dark energy and dark matter we cannot see. Otherwise, clusters of galaxies would fly apart because of gravity alone can't hold them together. Really? Pulsars are made up of strange matter. Otherwise, we can't explain their oscillator-like behavior. And this is perhaps one of the most interesting. Photographs of connections between two objects that have different red shifts are only chance alignments. See, the, the, if you have two things that are close together, apparently, with different red shifts, that means they're not only different distances apart, they're racing apart from one another. And well, that's only an accident. That doesn't explain anything. And there's some examples I'll mention for those that are interested chasing them down. See, otherwise, the Big Bang is falsified. Oh, really? See, Halton Arp was Edwin Hubble's assistant. He was a longtime observer at Mount Palomar and Mount Wilson telescopes. His photographs contradict the Big Bang theory. You don't read about that very much, do you? Yet they spent their life trying to chase those things. I love uh, what, Charles, uh, what uh, Lewis Carroll, as he's commonly known, Charles Dodson says in his, his uh, children's story called Look Through the Looking Glass. By the way, if you ever want an interesting book, you want to get a copy of uh, Lewis Carroll annotated by Martin Gardner, the mathematical editor of Scientific American. So you realize that Dodson wasn't just a children's story, it is a very, very perceptive pun and uh, treatment of mathematical scientific truth. But anyway, he has the, uh, I think it's the White King, says to Alice, Al One can't believe impossible things, Alice laughed. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the Queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. And this is Dodson with his tongue in his cheek poking fun at that kind of nonsense. But it really fits our situation today. So this is just a little warm-up to get into the boundaries of our physical reality. That may be, sound like a strange, and some of you that have come here have come because you've researched that phrase on the internet and discovered we're the only ones that talk about it. I'm, I'm intrigued with that. We're going to talk about the macrocosm. That's things larger than ourselves. And we'll discover, there, we'll discover there's a limit to largeness. We're going to explore the microcosm. Those are things smaller than ourselves. And we'll discover the most astonishing thing in science today is that there's limits to smallness, believe it or not. And because these two are boundaries, that which is outside the boundaries of reality, we call the metacosm. Outside, those things that are outside our present limits. And that turns out to be a very interesting area of study. That's why we have this kind of a preamble on our four 
session exploration of angels. Before we even get into them, we build this background. If you're going to study UFOs, if you're going to study the paranormal, you're dealing with the metacosm. So that's what we're, that's what we're into here. So I want to make a diagram here. I'm going to build what's probably the most important diagram of the session. And size increases going to the right on my, my this convention I'm using here on the slide. And I'm going to represent ourselves using Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man as a, just our idiom here of mankind. The reach of mankind. I think it's a good idiom for our personal reach. We're going to explore things larger than ourselves and we're going to call that the macrocosm. Things larger than ourselves and that of course reaches its ultimate in the field of astronomy, astrophysics and the like. So we're going to just explore that a little bit to discover some boundary conditions. The, one of the first things we encounter is the concept of thermal decay. We all notice that heat always flows from hot bodies to cold. How many have noticed that? Especially this morning, right? <laughs> okay. Because it does, we know that the uni- if, the in- if the universe was infinitely old, if it had been here forever, the temperature throughout the universe would be uniform. Because all the heat would have gone wherever it's cold. There'd be a uniform temperature. You could only do work with a difference in temperature. That leads to the whole study of thermodynamics is a study of work being done by a difference in temperature of some form. And so, well, since the universe uh, isn't uniform, uh, isn't uh, uh, uniform, it's not infinitely old. The universe had a beginning. We can prove that from thermodynamics. That's what leads to the conjectures that we call the Big Bang theories. There's a handful of them trying to explain how something came out of nothing. I'm going to show you how something came out of nothing. We see it in our physics labs all the time and don't recognize it, and I'll come back to that. The universe had a beginning and it's destined for an ending. Now thermodynamically, the, uh, the, 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 from the Big Bang, we finally know that when temperature finally gets uniform, the, unifor- the universe is over. I'm not suggesting it's going to take that long, because Peter tells us it's going to come to an end much sooner than that. But even thermodynamically, it has a limited life. Everything in the universe is winding down. The winding down of it is called entropy. Think of it as randomness and you're close to it. We're going to talk a little bit out about entropy. It's important for you to understand entropy. Some of our most profound mathematicians don't understand entropy, and I'll show you why. It refers, of course, to the ultimate heat death when we have uniform temperature. That's when entropy is maximized. If you think of entropy as randomness or noise, to an engineer there's a signal to noise ratio, right? Noise is is entropy, randomness. Disorder, those are all synonyms. Entropy is the antithesis of information. You have randomness at one end, design at the other. You have noise at one end, you have uh, information at the other. You have cacophony or music. In other words, as you move towards order, you're moving against entropy. You spend a Saturday and clean up the garage. It doesn't stay that way, does it? As time goes on, it gets clustered again. You, we things always, whether it's your locker at school, whatever, <laughs> things move towards randomness. If I had a deck of cards here and shuffle them, and then laid them out in bridge order, you'd be uncomfortable, wouldn't you? You'd expect things when shuffled to get more and more random. If I'm shuffling them and they came out in order, you'd think there's a trick of some kind. Why? Because it would seem as a reversal of time. Entropy is considered the arrow of time. Things intrinsically migrate in the direction of increasing entropy. And uh, so thermodynamics equations deals with entropy, of course, but it also turns out that much of the same mathematics applies to information. If you think of information as order, it, uh, it's, it's the opposite of entropy. Information is some, in fact, it's called negentropy in many papers. And that we're going to explore a little bit in the next session about the black hole paradoxes. And, uh, but the main point at this point to grasp is that entropy is the arrow of time whether we're talking about the experience we have in our own lives, 
whether we're talking about every field of science except one, encounters entropy increasing all the time. Every field of science except one. That's the field of biology. The only place we see entropy going the other way is in a process which we call life. And the more we study life, the more bizarre it turns out. And uh, in fact, let me just pause and give you an example of that. You have a fertilized cell, one cell, fertilized. It goes to my toes, it splits into two, identical cells, right? And those two go to four, four to eight, identical cells, right? All the information they have is located in each of those libraries inside those cells. But then as it continues, you notice the cells start not being quite exactly the same. They start specializing into certain kinds of tissues, cortical tissues, muscle, different kinds. And, and the, those tissues become organs. And those organs start having an architecture. Something's going on there that's not contained in the DNA. Let me explain what I mean. Let's assume every one of you in this room could play a musical instrument. In fact, every one of you could play any of the musical instruments. And there's plenty of them laying around here. I give each one of you a complete copy of a symphony. Everything you need to know is in that copy. I give each one of you a copy. Do we have a symphony? Of course not, because there's a missing element. Somebody has to do what we call in the computer field um, conflict resolution. Somebody has to say, you're going to be first violin, you're going to be percussion, etc., and orchestrate it. And that obviously is taking place in the formation of the entity that's coming out of the DNA. The fact there's complete instructions of some kind in each DNA doesn't explain another observation that my, my more profound doctor friends point out to me, that God has to be involved in every cell division. There is external information being added from outside to create life. You have a reversal of entropy. You have randomness going into, the, the, the raw materials going into a design that's coming from the outside. It's not contained within the cell. can't be, because they'd be all alike. You, you'd have everything being stem cells. You would have not especially. Anyway, entry is the error of time, which means if you can reverse the emperor, you can reverse the entropy. You have a time reversal. Can time go backwards? Great question. That's a whole session in its own right sometime. But I want to shift gears here and to acquaint you with a model that I think you will find very revealing. Robert Burnham publishes a famous book called *The Celestial Almanac*, and he suggests he takes advantage of an interesting coincidence here. It turns out that the number of inches in a statute mile are about say, a little over 63,000. And that happens to be about equal to the number of astronomical units in one light year. Now in astronomy, the distance from the sun to the earth is considered a basic unit. They call it the astronomical unit, okay, an AU. It just happens that the number of AUs in a light year is almost the same as the number of inches in a statute mile. So we're going to take advantage of that coincidence, and it's all, you know, it's, one's, uh, it's 63,300 is a close approximation. You with me? Of either one. So our error here is less than, you know, in the neighborhood of 1%. So Burnham's model that he suggests in his almanac, he uses this as a scaling ratio. We're going to make an imaginary model of the solar system here in our auditorium. And we're going to use this as our, our gauge. One inch represents the distance from the sun to the earth, and one mile represents one light year. That makes sense? You follow me so far? Okay, let's play this out and see what happens. The sun itself turns out to be about a hundredth of an inch in diameter on that scale. If you visualize it as a period here, a period here on my podium, Something, a hun you know, a hundredth of an inch, itty bitty, that's the sun. Well, so that's a tiny speck. All planets will turn out to be inside a seven-foot circle. 
Mercury will be four-tenths of an inch away, Venus about seven-tenths of an inch away, the Earth by definition one inch away. We said an inch is an astronomical unit, so we've got the little tiny speck, and then uh, Mercury, uh, Mercury, and uh, then we have uh, Mercury, then Venus, and then the Earth. So they're sitting right here an inch apart. You with me? Can you visualize this? Okay. Mars will be about an inch, uh, inch 1.6 inches. Jupiter, about 5 inches. Saturn, a little over 9 inches. Uranus, about 19 inches. Ooh, that's getting out there. Neptune, about 30 inches. And Pluto, 39.5. Literally within a, media, uh, 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 a meter radius from this little period, within a, a meter stick, we have rays of the whole model of the solar system. Are you with me so far? Okay, we're getting somewhere. We are now facing the uh, nearest star. The nearest star, as any astronomer will tell you, is, is uh, Alpha Centauri. It's about, by coincidence, it happens to be about the same size as, as our sun. And it's about four and a half light years away. That's four and a half miles away in our model. We've got our little solar system here in a seven foot circle. The nearest star, the nearest star, is a speck the side of a, size of a period, and it's four and a half miles away. And by the way, we have to square that according to gravitation laws. The denomination is d squared. So we take four and a half times four and a half to get the, the impression. A speck four and a half miles away. And so uh, two specks of dust four and a half miles apart. How much influence do you think gravity has? Next to none is the point, okay? If we visualize these little specks as golf balls, they'd still be 700 miles apart. Gravity between two golf balls, 700 miles, come on. Remember, the distance between them is squared before dividing into the product of the masses, according to Newton's famous laws of gravity. And uh, so that's the key point that is missed by most astronomers. Gravity is instinctive. When you talk about gravity in general, it's instinctive, especially in the solar system. It becomes instinctive. It turns out the laws that uh, eclipse it are the Maxwell equations that are very complex and non, non-intuitive. And we'll get into that. Electromagnetic forces. See, we've just gone from Sir Isaac Newton and gravity. We've gone to James Clark Maxwell and electromagnetism. Electromagnetic forces are 10 to the 36th power more powerful. If you take a, the four basic fundamentals in the uni- uh, uh, forces in the universe, um, you'll notice that gravity is 10 to the 36 times weaker than electromagnetism. And uh, so we have electromagnetic forces visualized 10 with 36 zeros after the one uh, times stronger. And not only that, it works in both directions, positive and negative. We haven't found anti-gravity. We're looking for it, but we don't see any evidence of it. So that means that we have discovered something the plasma physicists have been trying to tell us for decades. That the galaxies are not gravitationally related, they're electromagnetically related. They are plasma. Now, that's, most of us are not familiar with plasma. The effects of gravity are minuscule. And the le- electromagnetism is 10 to the 36 times as much. The entire volume of our galaxy is filled with diffuse clouds of magnetized plasma, electrically charged ionized particles. 99% of all the matter in the entire universe we now know is in a form of plasma. Now that may be a term not f- you're not familiar with. Most of us are not familiar with that. We know solids are. We know if we heat them up enough, they become liquid. If we heat them up enough, they become a gas. What we most of us haven't experienced, if you heat that gas enough, the actual molecules disassociate. They become ionized. That's not simply an ionized gas, uh, uh, electrified gas, it, it, it's a different form of matter. It has laws of its own that are very peculiar and been much studied and are surprisingly well understood by the plasma physicists. These are people that typically grew up in Norway, Sweden, in the northern latitudes. Because in the northern latitudes they see the auroras. They get interested in plasmas. They get into that. And there's a whole history of development in those latitudes that has eclipsed 
us in 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 uh, in other f- fields. So these f- there are four states of matter that we are aware of, and they go from order to entropy. As you increase that energy, as you heat these things, you're increasing the randomness of them, the heating of them. Those that forms that that follows thermodynamic laws, from which we've also learned laws of information. They're very very parallel. And what astonishes me, to get ahead of the story a little bit, is these brilliant mathematicians, Stephen Hawking and Penrose and these guys, they're brilliant, brilliant mathematicians, building elaborate models, create, they, they use entropy and information synonymously. No, they're opposites. And they fall into a logical trap that they've missed, and we'll come to that. Let's just take a look at some of these things. You look at Andromeda. Everybody's in every astronomy book. You'll see a picture of Andromeda, a very, very dramatic uh, uh, cluster out there. But if you look at that in infrared, you begin to realize there's something else going on than just the gravity. It's an electrical phenomenon. M82. And as you look at these in, with different uh, filters, you begin to realize there's more going on than most people realize. They're clearly electrical in their nature. If you've done any, if you've done any. Uh, experimentation with electromagnetism, you recognize the field patterns and so forth. And so, the, uh, and in Job, when, when, when God gives Job his science quiz, it's one of the most fun chapters in the Bible, chapter 38 of Job, where God gives him a science, he challenged, God challenges Job, can you bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades or the loose the bands of Orion? And he's not talking about gravity, he's talking about electrical and magnetic. And so, Galactic models. It's interesting that the plasma physicists have validated their theories with experimentation. Large-scale simulations of the Maxwell uh, and Lo- uh, Lorentz uh, equations by Peratt um, yields virtually indistinguishable uh, results from the astro images of the actual galaxies. If you look at his uh, simulations in the laboratory, the behavior of the galaxies can be replicated in plasmas. We, begin to, we, we understand the plasmas, and as you do, you begin to understand what the galaxies are telling us. There's also a thing you hear a lot about, the red shift. In the 20s, we notice that the, the uh, spectrum of the stars are shifted to the red. And uh, Edwin Hubble came up with a theory that uh, they're shifted in terms of they're moving away from us. That's where we get the theory of the expanding universe. And the, uh, Edward Hubble suggested that it was a Doppler effect. It was his explanation. And that is a widely accepted assumption even to this day, that the red shift in the spectrum are uh, a Doppler effect. And that's why we named the Space Telescope, the Hubble Telescope, is after Edwin Hubble, who founded that particular presumption. And uh, so it turns out that S- William Tift at the Stewart Observatory in Arizona he noticed that some of these shifts are to the blue, not the red. They're aberrant shifts, as they call them. And there, he also has recently, more recently discovered that they're digitized. They're, not, they're always shifted by a specific digital amount, which implies, by the way, they can't be a Doppler effect. They're caused by something else. In the 80s, Guthrie and Napier at the Edinburgh Observatory spent 10 years challenging the Hubble view and ultimately confirmed that Tift was correct. The Hubble view that, is, it, it, that was widely assumed even today in college courses of astronomy, you'll see that we have what is called the Ryberg formula that was invented by a Swedish physicist, Ryberg, in 1888. He used atomic physics to describe the wavelengths of the spectral lines and so forth. And this, is, this happens to be hydrogen, but every, you can tell what the stars are made of by the spectral lines. And they're on a logarithmic scale, by the way. I'm going to get back to logarithms in a minute. And they're due to the electrons moving between the energy levels of the atom. And uh, so we have these spectral shifts. And Millikan in 1925 noticed that the wavelengths were shifted from their theoretical position. He was the first to recognize the energy in space was battering the atoms and affecting their movement. And the energy was, it came to be called the zero-point energy. And you'll probably won't find one physicist in a hundred that even never even heard of that. And uh, the zero-point energy, Max Planck in 1911, and then Einstein, Stein, and Ernst and others, recognized that this pervasive energy was a universal phenomena and intrinsic. Dis- we think space is empty. No, it's not at all. Space has a fabric. 
face has, it's not empty. That's another myth that we've embraced. Through the work of Heisenberg and others, it began to be understood that Planck's constant was actually the measurement of the uncertainty in position of subatomic particles. And in 1962, it was realized that the uncertainty of position was caused by the battering by the so-called zero-point energy. And the energy is independent of temperature or mass, and that is a mystery as to why. That in and of itself. In 1987, Hal Putoff showed that electrons stayed in their orbits and did not... You ever wonder why an electron spinning around the nucleus doesn't either spin out or collapse in? It always is there. To well, that, uh, uh, they do, that's due to the expanded energy precisely because the energy they receive from the zero-point energy. They're balanced. Using 25 different methods, 475 measurements, and 11 different related quantities confirmed the, uh, fa the Planck formula. Planck's constant is increasing, the velocity of light is decreasing, but they stay in balance because energy stays constant. But those are both changing as we speak. The properties of space. There's a zero-point energy that's enormous, 10 to the 95th power of ergs per cubic centimeter. There is a thing called permittivity and, and permeability, and you take that the ratio and the square root of that, that's impedance. Every radio ham knows that if you have an antenna, you're trying to tune that antenna to the impedance of space. Space has impedance. impedance. If it was empty, it wouldn't have impedance. No, there's an impedance that we have to tune to. And uh, the velocity of light is, uh, at creation was uh, 10 to the 10th times what it was, is today. And so, well, let's just back off from all this and just take a few summary conclusions from the macrocosm. It had a beginning. It's not infinite. It may be expanding, but it's finite. Entropy poses its limit. The universe is, f the key fact that you wanna want you to carry from our exploration so far is that the universe is finite. Okay. Let's go the other way. Let's explore the microcosm, things smaller than ourselves. This is gonna plunge us into an exploration of quantum physics and subatomic particles. And uh, we always talk about the model of an atom. If we take the simplest one to talk of, it would be hydrogen. Got a nucleus, and we have an electron. We know the size of that uh, total thing, is, uh, of the atom, is about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. But the nucleus is about 10 to the minus 13th centimeters. Those numbers are not important. The ratio is. In other words, what, we're, what we discover is that the atom is about 100,000 times the size of the nucleus. That's the key point here. The rats are linear ratio, 10 to minus 13, it's about 10 to minus 8. If you took the nucleus as a golf ball, just to make a model of the atom here, then you're going to put the electron three miles away. You've got a golf ball here, that's the nucleus. If you're going to build this to scale, a model to scale, conceptually at least, you have an electron there three miles away. What's my point? Okay. That means that's linear. The area involved is 10 to the 10th. The volume of that atom is 10 to the 15th times the size of the nucleus. Are you with me so far? You follow the, the, the rough math, okay? Well, that's interesting. The 10 to the 15th is a big number. It's the same ratio as one second has to 30 million years. 10 to the 15th is a big number. If I say this is solid, and you say, Chuck, there's nothing there, do you realize you're more correct than I am? It's empty space by, uh, uh, it's conjecture number two that it's empty space rather than solid is the same ratio as one second has to 30 million years. Those of you that maintain that this is mostly empty space are more correct than my... Uh, and now you say, wait a minute, then why does it feel so solid? Because it's an electrical simulation. The electrical fields that make up my atoms of my hand are colliding with the atoms making up this, even though both of them are mostly empty space. Are you with me so far? Okay. It gets worse. Okay. There's... the. Everything that we discover is made up of indivisible units called quanta. That's why they use the term quanta. It's a quantum is a singular, quanta is the plural. And if I take a piece of string, obviously I can cut it in half 
and throw half of it away. No problem so far. And you would think, whatever I've got left, I can cut that in half and throw half away. And you would think I could do that forever. I might get so small I couldn't do it practically, but I could at least imagine cutting whatever I have left in half. And I could do that forever. Wrong. You can't. Because we discover when you get down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and you try to cut that in half, what you've got then has a property that is bizarre. It loses a property that the physicists call locality. If I try to cut it in half one more time, we discover that that what is left is immediately connected with everything else in the universe. They call that non-locality. And if, that's why one of the early particle physicists committed suicide. Because he understood what he thinks that, and he couldn't handle what that implied. He couldn't unravel that. The Planck length is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. There's a unit of time that's shorter than anything else you can imagine. It's not the time since the light changed and the per honk guy honks behind you. No. No, there's a shorter period of time. It's called 10 to the minus 43. Paul relates to it, by the way. If you take the speed of light and have it transit something as thin as your retina, that's a twinkle of an eye. And it's 10 to the minus 43 centimeters. But that's another discussion for another time. We discover that everything, energy, mass, linear distances, time, all have a Planck limit. Planck's constant creates a limit beyond which it has no local existence. It's everywhere. So the world of quantum physics, it's non-causal and non-deterministic. Everything is probabilistic. and There's nothing deterministic in this world, strangely enough. Nothing's real. It's all stochastic. It's all, uh, you, you, you cannot say anything about things you're doing when we're not looking at them. Light is waves, and yet you're, if you examine it, it's a particle, but only when, it's, only when you're examining it. And there's a whole other thing we can get into. Reality is not local. Every particle in the universe is somehow interconnected, and this should be a clue to some recent discoveries they've just made. In another way, non-locality. Back in 1964, John Stuart Bell formulated a mathematical approach to uh, demonstrating this, but there wasn't the technology to actually do it. In 1982, a group at, CER, at the Institute of Theoretical and Applied uh, Optics in Paris conducted a landmark experiment. Alan Aspect, Jean Talabard, and Gerard Roger um, they did the, the famous, it's now famous, two-particle experiment. Two photons from heating heat cesium atoms and lasers each traveled in opposite directions through six and a half meters of pipe to, to special polarization analyzers. The filter switched in 10 to the nanoseconds, 30 nanoseconds less than the 13 meters of travel between them. The photons, to make a long story short, actually demonstrated non-locality. So this theoretical idea was validated in the laboratory and has since. So, and anyone who is not shocked by quantum theory just hasn't understood it. If you, if you understand quantum theory, it's staggering as you think these discoveries through. In fact, to show you the extremes we're going to, to explore smallness, you need to know about the large-scale uh, Hadron uh, Collider, probing the limits of smallness. The Large Hadron Collider. Colliding protons will rec recreate energies and conditions last seen a trillionth of a second after the initial moment of creation. That's their goal, using the, using the Big Bang yardstick here. CERN, you hear that all the time. It's the uh, European Center for Nuclear Research, but it doesn't work because it's actually in French. If you always wondered why, you know, it's the acronym for the French Conseil European pour la Recherche Nucléaire. So everybody just calls it CERN. Okay, that's the European super center, if you will. They've spent eight, over $8 billion for 14 years building this contraption. 10,000 scientists from over 100 countries are participating in this uh, effort. These are some snapshots of it to give you a feeling for the scope of this thing. And uh, the Large Hadron Collider. It spans the border between Switzerland and France near Geneva. It's some 300 feet underground. The largest machine in the world has a circumference of 17 miles. Fastest racetrack in the world, 
trillions of protons traveling at almost the speed of light, guided by 9,300 magnets, 600 million collisions per each second, which means very rare events may probably occur, may events that we've never seen before. There are serious scientists afraid that they're going to create a black hole that'll suck in the Earth. They really, they're, they, they, these are dismissed as just worry warts, but they're pretty sophisticated worry warts. Traveling at an energy of over seven tera electron volts, in an ultra vacuum, 13 times the vacuum of the Moon, over 10 times the Moon, temperatures over 100,000 times the core of the Sun. That's what they're playing with here, in the nice little sandbox to play in. This is a picture. If you look closely, you can see that this is 20 stories high or whatever. And uh, the, the circumference is, a, is not just a tube, it's a very, very sophisticated contraption um, that has been built. And this is not a proposal, it's there being put together. And it's huge. Now, Let's back up a second. You know, Einstein, of course, did his revolution. Um, started in 1905 by, by his, uh, his special theory of relativity. But that really led to the general theory of relativity in 1915, which is valuable to every one of us for a lot of reasons. It points out that there's no distinction between time and space. And uh, that we live in not three dimensions, not Euclidean, we live in a four-dimensional geometry. And that is the thing that has changed the thinking of science over the past... Uh, a century, literally. We've gone beyond Euclid. You see, Einstein went to his death frustrated. That, well, but first of all, back the most important lecture in mathematics ever given, probably, on June 10th of 1854, where George Riemann introduced the concept of metric sensors. It took 60 years for it to yield practical results because it was the mathematics that gave Einstein his four-dimensional space-time. He went to his death frustrated because he couldn't solve some problem between light and gravity. If he had applied the same method he used to get the general theory by just adding, going up another dimension, it would have yielded. But he didn't, that di wasn't discovered until 1953 by Clues and Klein, that more than four dimensions start to yield light and supergravity. And the saga continues to when you get to 1963, ten years later, Yang and Mills fields are discovered, which resolve electromagnetic and both the nuclear forces. And so they've got them all resolved except gravity. That's why there's such a search for gravity waves, and th that's an area of, of exploration. But since 1984 on, most thinkers in this area have embraced some variation of what we call superstrings, that there's ten dimensions involved. If we try to synthesize what we think we know about uh, 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 the, w the universe, uh, this, the current estimate is that they, we live in at least 10 dimensions, maybe more, but 10 seem to be suggested by a number of things. And so, the dimensions of reality. It's fascinating to realize that in the 13th century, Nachmanides, a Hebrew sage, in his just studying the text of the book of Genesis, concluded that the universe has 10 dimensions, that four of them are knowable and six of them are not knowable, using his vocabulary, in 1263. I think it's interesting because the particle physicists of the 20th century have discovered that we live in ten dimensions. Four of them are directly measurable, three spatial dimensions in time. Six of them we know are there, but we can't get at because they're curled in less than 10 to the minus 35 centimeters. That's smaller than the wavelength of light. There's no way for us to prove it. But we know they're there from mathematical behavior. They're only inferable by indirect means. We've spent billions of dollars on atomic accelerators to discover what Nachmanides discovered in the 13th century studying the book of Genesis. Let that sink in. That's not a contrived thing, that's a reality. The boundaries of reality. Okay, we've looked at the microcosm, made up of indivisible units. You can't make them smaller than that. You run into the Planck's limit, I call it the Planck wall, if you will, of length, mass, energy, or time. And the current estimate is not four dimensions that we experience, actually ten. And we'll get into that in the next session. But I'm going to show you the diagram that's the most important thing of the day. We put ourselves in the middle of this diagram with it as the reach of man. The larger things are the macrocosm, four dimensions, the fourth dimension time, it had a beginning. It, the universe, is finite, staggering in its implications. Going the other way, the microcosm, indivisible units, Planck limits as I've mentioned, ten dimensions. 
The point is that these two boundaries bounder our reality. You can't get larger than the macrocosm. You can't get smaller than the microcosm. The region that is excluded outside these things for lack of another label, that implies that the environment we're in is a virtual environment that's digital. You and I are living in an elaborate electronic game, a virtual game. The point is, that's where we actually are. And the region that surrounds us, for lack of another label, we're going to call the metacosm. That's the region outside the limits of our physical reality. That's not a contrivance by ourselves. That's the conclusion of Scientific American. In an article in in, uh, uh, June of 2005, they did an article in which they conclude that our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. When I saw that, it blew me away. Because that's what the Bible has been saying all along. And that's the region we're going to explore as we go forward in the next session. We're going to need to understand a little bit about hyperspaces. Spa- the, what do you mean by hyperspace? It's space more than three dimensions. That you, we're familiar with three dimensions. Hyperspaces are more, if you have spaces, more than three. And by the way, you find that in the Bible. Did you know that? In Ephesians 3, Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Did you get that, what Paul just said? The breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. Four dimensions. And if you could take those four words in the Greek, you discover they are, in fact, Uh, three spatial dimensions, and time. And uh, you've got these four dimensions in the text of the Bible. That shouldn't surprise us. Those are the four that we can directly encounter. There are six more that we'll talk about in the next session. Now, only two kinds of people can handle hyperspaces. Mathematicians with special training or small children. They both can relate to that. But you and I can gain some insights by going the other way. We're three-dimensional beings, and we're indebted to a concept uh, uh, that was developed by Edwin Abbott back at the turn of the century. Uh, I want to introduce two friends of mine. But I want you to be compassionate, because these two friends of mine suffer from a serious handicap. They only live in two dimensions. I call them Mr. and Mrs. Flat. And we're going to take Mr. and Mrs. Flat and put them in a two-dimensional world a flat plane. Two-dimensional people in a two-dimensional world. Now I come along as a third-dimensional person and I can do something that's casual to me that they can't conceive of. I can pick up Mrs. Flat and put her next to Mr. Flat and she will not understand what just happened. It was a miracle. She just entered a trans-dimensional travel. We see that happening in the Bible, in the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. That's trans-dimensional travel. It gets more complicated than that. I, as a third-dimensional being, can come and I can put my finger a millionth of an inch away from Mr. Flat, at the same time a millionth of an inch away from Mrs. Flat. I can enjoy more intimacy with both of them, independent of where they each are. My relationship to each of them has nothing to do with their geographic location. Why? Because I'm, ad- I'm trying to communicate what an additional dimension gives me. That gives me some clue as to what an additional dimension God has. Okay? If I poke my finger through their universe, what do they see? They don't see my finger. They see nothing, then a dot that grows into a circle and then goes... They just see the intersection of my finger with their dimensionality. Those aspects of my dimensionality that go beyond their two, they don't have any conception of. An example of that would be a ball floating through their universe. They don't see the ball. The zadat goes to a circle and then disappears. If it's a UFO, it can materialize and disappear. If it's an angel, it can materialize and disappear. And yes, there's a total difference between demons and angels, but that's a whole other study. And uh, so... How would you communicate 
a three-dimensional object to a two. I've got this two-dimensional people there. I want to show them. I want to communicate them three dimensions. How do I do that? Maybe by a projection. I can take a three-dimensional object and make a projection orthographically like an architect might or something. That somehow doesn't really sound too useful. If I have an actual four-dimensional thing, and there are some on the internet you can play with, the more you play with them, you realize you have no instinct as to what, that, what they do. That's a three-dimensional projection of a four-dimensional hypercube, and you can play with those. You quickly realize that we can't really, as a three-dimensional, you can't grasp them. Not very useful. There's another way I might communicate my three-dimensional object to a two-dimensional universe, and that would be to unravel it. I take my box, say, and I unfold it. We've all done those, put those boxes together. We can represent a three-dimensional box in its unraveled form. Not too useful, but it's a way we might be able to communicate to a two-dimensional being a three-dimensional object. Did you know that there is a way of unraveling a four-dimensional cube into three dimensions? It's called a, a tesseract. That's a four-dimensional cube unraveled into three dimensions. There's only one place I know of that's ever actually been used other than in a mathematical class. And that's in a painting by Salvador Dali, Corpus Christi. It stunned me to realize that Dali was that sophisticated mathematically to recognize the crucifixion was more than four dimensions. At that night after the resurrection, the disciples are in a six-sided space, a floor, a ceiling, and four walls sealed off, the doors locked, and guess who? Somebody shows up without passing through the four walls. They think he's a spirit. He says, handle me and see a spirit that has not flesh and bones as you see me have. He comes and he leaves. Comes and leaves. We're looking at hyperdimensional travel. And by the way, John, 1 John 3, 2, as a physics statement, most people reading their Bible, unless they have had the background you've just gotten, would not understand. John says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Staggering statement. Staggering. Whatever dimensionality Jesus enjoys, we will enjoy. Because we're not going to see a representation of him, we're going to see him as he is. Wow! The more you know about physics, the more staggering that statement is. We know that he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. In the next session, we're going to look at a little tutorial on holography, and we're going to talk about David Bohm's remarkable insights of, uh, uh, you know, almost a century ago. We'll discover some noise they've discovered that's changed the thinking. We'll talk a little bit about the so-called black hole paradox. Don't be scared. We're going to dismiss that rather quickly as these string theorists examine the proverbial elephant. And then we'll look at the holographic universe and, it's, and be ready for some staggering surprises. And with that, let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for bringing us here together. We thank you for your presence. And we do pray, Father, through your Spirit, you would open our understanding to that which you have here for us, that we might grow in grace in the knowledge of our coming King, that we might be more effective stewards of the opportunities you're bringing forth before us as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservations. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah indeed. Amen.